Uh, and so now that we've covered the business ends of the program, I am pleased and delighted to introduce Donna Walker, the Executive Director of Jefferson County Public Library. Thank you, Nick. Um, good evening. Hi, everybody. I'm Donna Walker. I'm Executive Director for Jefferson County Public Library. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this year's signature author event with celebrated author Jeff Vandermeer and special guest Ian Tafoya. Uh, essential to meeting the mission of the library to build an educated and vibrant community by providing equal access to information ide and ideas and opportunities is that the programs we offer appeal to people of all backgrounds and interests. The fact that we have almost 700 people registered for tonight's event and hundreds more registered to hear the recording helps us know that we're meeting that mission. I'd like to note that this is a fully inclusive program. The Community Language Cooperative is delivering live Spanish interpretation, as Nick said, and also we're offering ASL interpretation as well to ensure access for everyone who wants to be able to participate. I'd like to thank the members of our JCPL team who worked tirelessly to bring you this event tonight. Before turning the program over to our guest speakers, I'd like to share some brief information about them. You will find full biographies on the Jefferson County Public Library website. Here are a few highlights. New York Times bestselling author, Jeff Vandermeer's latest novel is the critically acclaimed eco-thriller, Hummingbird Salamander. His novel, Annihilation, won the Shirley Jackson Award and Nebula Award as well, in addition to being made into a movie from Paramount Pictures. His novel, Born, has been optioned by AMC for development as a TV series. His nonfiction writing has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and the Atlantic Online. Published since he was a teenager, Jeff Vandermeer's books have been translated into 37 languages. Currently, he is working on land conservation in North Florida and has a major article on Florida's environment appearing in Current Affairs next month. Jeff is also working on more novels and an illustrated book on rewilding. Guiding the conversation tonight is Ian Tafoya. Ian is a water protector who holds a BA in political science with a minor in Native American studies, a water studies certificate, and an early childhood education certificate from Metropolitan State University of Denver, as well as a horticultural therapy certificate from Colorado State University. He is active in Denver Public Affairs, Colorado Public Policy, and Federal Environmental Policy, and has a depth of experience working in various political arenas. Currently, he serves as the Colorado State Director for Green Latinos. Ian has received recognition for his work from the Denver Regional Council of Governments, the Denver Regional Air Quality Council, and most recently was named a River Hero by the National River Network. This is a power pack duo for our program tonight. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank Book Bar, which is the official seller for this event. Uh, be sure to request a World Reborn book plate with Jeff Vandermeer's signature to enhance your purchase. Uh, once again, welcome to World Reborn. I hope you enjoy tonight's program. Okay, I think we're getting started here. Really excited to be here and thank you so much to Jefferson County Libraries for hosting us today. It's been amazing to be here in the community and see how much effort was put in by the staff and I wanna start by thanking them. I also wanna just thank every librarian for all the work that you do, the social work you do in our community, the community building and the education. We know just how important libraries are for everybody and for me, it was my favorite place outside of the Museum of Nature and Science as a kid. So to have this opportunity was really exciting. And you know, I actually had a chance to build one of the Jefferson County libraries when I was a college student. Oh, nice. I worked as an electrical <laughs> apprentice, um, working on the Arvada library itself from the ground up. So, so cool to be here. And thank you so much, Jeff, for being here today. How are you today? 
I'm good. I'm good. It's it's been a good day. The yard is absolutely just amazing right now because of the uh, the, the the transition from spring to summer. Um, I'd also like to say I am so impressed with this library team. I have never seen an event set up so amazingly, uh, so smartly, and with so much amazing outreach to the community. So thank you so much for that. Thanks to to Book Barn. It's it's so wonderful to talk to you tonight. Well, I think we're going to jump right into it to maybe talk a little bit about what inspires you to do your work. What kind of experiences do you have in Florida and those ecosystems that make you want to write about nature in your books? Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, I moved around a lot as a kid. Uh, I did live in Fiji for a while, but in a way where although we were there long enough, we were not really embedded in such a sense where you you become like a citizen of the country you're in. And we moved around a lot after that as well. So I never really had a sense of one place to write about. And so I think I started out writing fantasy to kind of reconcile those places I did live in without kind of, uh, while respecting them by not writing about them directly because I still didn't know enough about them. Uh, so finally moving to Florida when I was uh, in my early teens and now living here since I, you know, I'm now 53, you know, I began to become kind of Im immersed in the setting. I became uh, amazed by the biodiversity here. I became amazed by all the contradictions between the politics uh, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the actual landscape and, and how those things often were at odds with one another when they shouldn't be. And, and, and I just I just felt a responsibility at, at some point um, to address in my fiction something about this amazing place. And, and eventually I, I, be, I knew enough about it, had been here 20, 30 years that that books like Annihilation started coming out uh, where where I thought I could in, in a way that was was useful, maybe mesh Florida with the environmental concerns. So, you know, your the books in your talk, the topics in your books often talk about things like climate crisis, climate change. Mm -hmm. Do you feel a moral imperative as a writer to tackle topics like this? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it, it, it is something that, that, that I, I, I've, I've actually been grappling with since my first novel, Venice Underground, back in the mid 90s is when I wrote that one. And, and it was pretty clear then that we were, we were hurtling towards uh, the middle of climate crisis. And that it would be unevenly distributed and some people would feel it sooner than others uh, for various reasons, including social inequity. And, uh, and so it's just become more direct in the writing as we've become been moving more through it. And, and so it has become something where it, it's, I write about it a lot. I try to find different angles to write about it. You know, I think sometimes that I'm writing for different types of readers. Sometimes I'm, I'm writing for the kind of reader who believes in climate crisis or climate change, but they don't think anything's going to actually happen for 30 or 40 years. And I'm hoping something in the novel in combination with other things. So I think it's, there's some hubris in thinking a novel can like change someone's mind, but maybe it can begin to nudge somebody in the right direction. Um, that, that's sometimes the kind of reader that I'm, that I'm writing for. Uh, sometimes it's a more buried message. Hummingbird Salamander is just the most direct direct way that I've talked about it. And I think in one of the library uh, promotion pieces, I talked about how I was challenged by an environmental science class who liked annihilation to write something more direct, you know, and how do you do that without being didactic? Cause I want, I don't want to write an essay. I still want to write a, a story with characters and everything. And one way I found to, to do it with Hummingbird Salamander is, is to use the thriller format and to use the central mystery that's about the environment to put those things in more directly uh, in conflict, so. Well, you know, here in Colorado, you talk about mm. things that are playing out in front of our eyes. You know, just this Earth Day, all mm. of a sudden, early wildfires. Mm. I get to travel for my job across the state of Colorado, mm. and I hear time and time again from farmers concerns about water. Mm -hmm. now, those are issues that are literally in people's faces now. When mm -hmm. Florida, what kind of issues do you see confronting your community that really signal that climate crisis is here? It's, uh, it, it's three things that I see, and, and, and they're kind of connected to what you're, you're saying in Colorado, but they're expressed differently. So we're poisoning our water. We have an amazing aqu underground aquifer, and we're basically poisoning it and loading it up with herbicide and fertilizer and all kinds of other things. So we're kind of destroying our drinking water, you know, in, in a sense where we have such an abundance of it. How, how can we possibly, when we have abundance and other people don't, destroy this thing so willfully and, and not protect it. And then in terms of wildfires, we've actually had an amazing uh, uh, controlled burn program 
through all of our forests and 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 state parks and and national refuges uh, that is now uh, you know that helps protect against actual you know wildfires that are out of control. But the problem is the unplanned growth, uh, all, none of which is affordable housing, means that more and more communities are so close to these areas that need the controlled burn that they can't be done anymore. So we're now also putting ourselves in a situation where we're going to have more unplanned wildfires because we can't do the land management we need to. Uh, and you're beginning to see that. So, so now you're beginning to see a situation where we may also, <laughs> because of the politics of, of the environment seeming to be about one side and the other side being in control. And so they're just kind of like, they, they see it as politicized in a way it shouldn't be, uh, kind of like uh, messing ourselves up in, in, in that way as, as well. And then the last one is just simply the rain. It used to be that through the spring and summer, you would have a gentle rain from like three to five almost every day. Now what you have is a deluge for like three or four days in North Florida and then nothing for 12. And so you have these mini droughts and then these flood situations. And that's happening more and more. Uh, and in addition, the humidity stays constant through the winter. It used to dip down in the winter. Now it's the same in the winter as in the summer, no matter what the temperature is. So, so those, those are actually big deals in terms of like how you insulate houses, uh, you know, how, how, how people can, can be out and about and, and if they have stressors what, on their health, you know, what that, how that affects them. Uh, so those, those are the things I see. There, there's plenty more if you've been watching the news about Florida, but those are some of them uh, that come to mind. You know, I've noticed that change too here where, you know, most people wouldn't think of Colorado as having monsoons, but we get monsoons oh God. <laughs> in the late summer that come up from yeah. Baja yeah. and there's just been a change. And mm -hmm. then, you know, you start talking about hail damage and all these other things that are associated mm -hmm. with the maximum storms that really start to verge. You know, I had a chance to visit Florida a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. I won a couple of campaigns, decided I was going to visit all the national parks. Mm -hmm. And it's such an interesting dynamic. It feels very similar to Colorado, mm -hmm. where there's this love of the outdoors. Mm -hmm. Then you yeah, have the agriculture definitely. and you have this kind of push pull between growth and tourism mm -hmm. that seems to really take place in like Southern Florida. And you're mm -hmm. right. Like when you read about how Lake Okeechobee is just not a healthy place. And then that load of extra pollution and nutrients pouring down into the Everglades. It's, a, it's unfortunate to see, you know, human beings just causing so much of the harm. You know, you, it's interesting you talk about housing because mm -hmm. I, this is one I bring up a lot, right? The things that are causing climate change, like transportation, the burning of fossil fuels. Yeah. We're seeing housing built in areas where we know there's pollution and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you're next to a highway and that's where land is cheap. Mm -hmm. or former you know polluted land and you put mm -hmm. 300 people there when there was maybe yeah. only seven people there before it sounds similar to what you're saying about the fires absolutely and i think it's a national problem too because and i'd have to check like the actual uh, developers involved but there's so many national international developers that are doing cookie cutter again not affordable housing uh situations with these massive developments they don't care where they're built and so that's why I think there's a, a synchronicity there too, because it may even be the same builder, you know, that's beginning to say, hey, we need this 700 acres right outside of Tallahassee. And it just happens to be an area that, you know, runoff is going to feed into the aquifer in a way that it's not supposed to. And that's why the forest has been preserved to this point. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating because we do need housing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and there's enough ways to do it to make it affordable and also environmentally sound but but we have this profit margin so like in florida i'm sure they do this other places too they raise everything they get rid of the topsoil they clear cut 700 acres there's not a tree left and then they put in these cookie cutter homes that are not actually that well made but are still like four hundred thousand five hundred thousand dollar houses in the middle of nowhere and then of course they have to build the infrastructure you're talking about that which is incredibly harmful in so many ways instead of you know trying to infill uh, you know, and then they, they, the developers have begun to use the same terminology that urban strategists have. So a developer will say NIMBY, <laughs> and what they really mean is anyone who's opposing their thousand acre, you know, carnage. Um, so yeah, it's a really, it's a complicated problem. And I think it's a national one. And I, I, I think looking at Florida, looking at, like you said, at Colorado is really instructional for those places that haven't, haven't experienced this yet, you know? So since we're kind of talking about a sense of place, you know, your work tends to be rooted in a sense of place. 
whether that's a fantasy metropolis or an oblique and hostile natural reserve, but there's always a sense of danger in the locations. Why is that? Well, that's a very good question. Um, for some people, it's less of a danger depending on how much they've hiked in Florida. So when I was like writing Annihilation, I didn't really think that like the natural landscape would seem that harmful. Like, you know, I have actually had to jump over an alligator before to, to get back past a, a back to the, he the, the head of a trail. Um, and, uh, you know, there are certain things in Annihilation like being charged by a boar that happened to me that were terrifying, but for the most part, uh, I don't find the natural world, uh, you know, that that uh, frightening. Uh, so so there's a difference depending on who the reader is, first of all. Uh, but then secondly, obviously, I'm also exploring the uncanny or something beyond uh, human comprehension, which I find kind of an interesting place to kind of examine, you know, uh, how irrational our institutions are to begin with. Um, I didn't really think about annihilation and area X within annihilation as being this zone that was comparable to how climate crisis can appear to people, you know, diffuse, unknowable, you know, uh, you know, hard to get your mind around, uh, but it kind of, kind of makes sense. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's, it, it, there's this, this uh, sense of dread, but it depends on the reader. And uh, most of the time I'm trying to, also say something about how amazing the world is around us and, and that we need to to kind of see it more clearly if we can. Well, you know, when I think about the sense of dread, right, and I travel and I talk with communities who can't mm. drink their water, I think yeah. this is true all across, whether you're talking toxic sugar fields in yeah. Florida, Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. often people who are already at the margins, right, you're yeah. living in, say, mobile homes. And there is kind of a sense of dread, right? Because there's like invisible mm -hmm. chemicals. And I think that comes across in your book, right? With this place X, you're like, what is, what is the thing that is doing this? And it's mm -hmm. like, you're reversing, you, you know, you need scientists to figure it out, but you also kind of need like political will to figure it out too. Yeah. And, and it's also, I think the lack of control and um, it's, it's, uh, it's something that the Tallahassee community is experiencing the more predatory local government has become and the more aligned with developers. So you're having, it, I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of an interesting wake up call for the middle class in this town too, because the poor communities in this town have been experiencing this for a while, basically being dumped on with whatever, even having recently a small African-American community forced to move basically for a large holding pond. You know, this kind of crap is supposed to not happen now, but it still does. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, I think that there is also uh, uh, this dread because sometimes the forces that are arrayed against you just having a chance to live a normal life in a decent place uh, are, are so powerful. And it's such an intricate uh, mesh of special interests that it's hard to untangle and find the way to get the knot out, so to speak. Uh, so that's something that that actually in the ravine novel that I'm working on, I'm, I'm lazy, so I'm actually working on a novel set in the ravine I live off of, um, is allowing me to kind of put those social strata in there um, from the kind of like white upper class, middle class to to um, other communities. Um, and also just the overlay like in Tallahassee, if you look at the neighborhood names. Their plantation names. <laughs> they're, 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 they're the names of the plantations before. And if you don't know that, you, you really are, are not understanding the history of this place. So, yeah, you know, I just, I think about these like, I, I do slam poetry, right? It's these like mm -hmm. tiny toxic particles that are terrorizing our lungs. The mm -hmm. people themselves are looking for water that quenches mm -hmm. the thirst of environmental justice. Do you feel like as you're writing this, there is a sense of unity that is coming together between? Mm -hmm people across class uh, to really target the people who have been the center of this problem because, you know, recently Frontline on PBS was releasing a three-part series about how just much the middle class was targeted by advertising mm -hmm. to dissuade us from really taking action mm -hmm. early in my childhood, of course, and here we are now mm -hmm. uh, with seven years left. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think the apathy is the, is the big thing that concerns me. And I understand the apathy. It's exactly what you say. It's the fact that we're, we're often fed this message that either we, we can't effectuate change or we're fed a message where we don't even know that there's change that needs to be enacted, you know? And I would count myself in, 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 in feeling 
ultimately kind of guilty that it took me a long time to wake up to the specifics of like the processes of local government here in my community. You know, I was more focused on like national environmental issues or general Florida issues uh, until recently. And it's really eye opening when you begin to look at local government and you look at both the ways in which the people you elect sometimes have power you didn't even believe they had to do whatever they want to do, but also that you do have the ability to, to effectuate change if you come together. Uh, one thing that we're dealing with is that our governor and legislature want to put all these toll roads in remote areas of the state, destroying farmland, destroying rural areas, um, basically to, to, uh, <laughs> to profit road builders and developers again. Uh, and you, you do see people from across the political spectrum having to communicate with one another and having to form allegiances to, to fight this thing that everybody except the state thinks is a terrible idea. So I'd see even in this age of like extremism where it's hard to find common ground, I do find that, that there are some issues that, that seem to pull people together. You know, the highway expansion is an interesting one. That's kind of how I built my career. Mm. I left my job at city council to run for city council in opposition to a highway widening mm. through, yeah. you know, disturbing land, widening it, additional air pollution. And now as we're talking about just infrastructure, right? Because we passed yeah. this massive package at the national level. Are we really thinking about like where the products are made? Because asphalt facilities located in low income frontline communities. Concrete facilities, same thing. And the raw goods themselves are often drawn from a place like we have a place here in Colorado called Glenwood Springs. They are literally hot springs, right? That is the mm -hmm. draw to them. That is the commercialization and the tourism. And what we see is that they're willing to drill, businesses are willing to drill cores that may endanger the very lifeline of this community in order to get more raw materials to ship to call, you know, down to Denver mm -hmm. so that we can build more of these unsafe boxes that you're talking about. It's, it's, it's something that I think we need to break down, right? This urban rural divide, I think is again, mm -hmm. messaging that's been used for a really long time to oh, divide yeah. us. And it mm -hmm. feeds into a party system that clearly isn't serving us when it comes to our health. No, and I mean, and when you really look at most environmental issues, and it's hard to find, think of one in Florida that isn't connected to it to some degree, there's always some element of, of social justice, because there's always the hidden costs and the hidden costs, like you say, are always unevenly distributed. Here in Tallahassee, what I find Orwellian is that the same developers who have pushed to have the rural urban divide erased so that we now have potentially 5000 acres of sprawl <laughs> to the north of us now talk about infill to destroy the remaining urban wilderness corridors we have within the city limits, which would make perfect sense to infill there if we were not also infilling, so to speak, throughout the entire rural area. So we're basically destroying everything and the quality of life with it. So, so this Orwellian thing where they get the thing they want, where they destroy the rural urban divide, but then they also come back and then they try to do everything within the city as well all while not doing affordable housing. In fact, there's one uh, development, False Chase, where they managed to do this thing where they split it between the city and the county and then changed the, the property line, the county city line, so that they could exactly at the point where it meant that it was like, I don't know, half and half or a third and two thirds, where they would not have to do any affordable housing. <laughs> it's the most cynical thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's not funny. I'm laughing at the, the, the cynicism, the, the absurdity of, of, you know, thinking about the meeting where they sat down and they had that discussion just so they couldn't have affordable housing, you know, any, any little bit of it. Well, I think it's really good that, you know, you're attending these meetings, you're getting involved, you clearly have a busy schedule and are and writing, you're spending time in your garden. How do you find the time to balance to be a present and active person in civics? while also advancing your goals. Well, I mean, you know, it's nothing like like what you do. What I'm looking to, to do, I mean, nothing like the scope of what you do. What, what I'm trying, what I do best is I write novels. And uh, so I have to keep focused on that. And that's also, you know, what pays the bills. Uh, but what I try to find is I try to find the opportunities where no one else is doing a thing, or I try to find the opportunity where I can aid somebody who's already doing something. Cause I think the most obnoxious thing you can do is come in <laughs> and start doing stuff without understanding and listening to the people who are already doing it. And I don't want to reinvent the wheel. So the property that we've helped protect like the Cypress swamp right outside of Tallahassee is something no one else was focused on. No environmental organizations were focused on it because it was too small. 
um, things like that. Um, but it was a really vital habitat. So that was one thing we tried to get done and did. I uh, became involved with a new media site to try to shine a light on kind of what I would call institutional corruption. We didn't have a lot of good coverage of development from the local paper. So that felt like, you know, filling a need. And in terms of like the time, uh, well, you know, basically I would have these lulls, lulls <laughs> where I would write a novel and then I would write a nonfiction book. And so what I've been doing now, instead of writing the nonfiction book is I've been taking that time and trying to put it towards the environmental stuff. The thing I want to do next is I want to commission an independent urban canopy survey for the county that drills down, looks at redlined uh, districts uh, and, and neighborhoods as well, and uh, really shows you know, what we've lost. Because if you look at the city, they, they keep saying we have 55% canopy cover, even as we lose like 200 acres at a time. So I know that's not true anymore. Um, and they have no real interest in correcting that. <laughs> fact so um so I'm, that's one thing that i can potentially provide that might be useful to a lot of citizens to actually see that data and what it means well man i you're speaking my language when i ran for city council <laughs> i ran on trees trash and transportation mm -hmm. we had a study done of the canopy and i knew mm -hmm. that my block that my mother lived on where you could see a mm -hmm. smokestack in the distance mm -hmm. we had the largest uh tree on the block mm -hmm. and they've slowly just started disappearing you know and mm -hmm. We need to make an effort and it's fascinating because you talk about the divide in equity. There are some areas in our community where the government literally has entire parkways with massive tree canopies they water. Mm -hmm. And then their solutions in the poor communities is, here's a tree, we'll teach you how to take care of it, but you're <laughs> responsible for yeah. the water. Yeah. And there, th that coordination I think needs to flip. Like we know there's so many benefits from the canopy, from mm -hmm. the air quality, the lower emissions, um, the temperature difference water retention for storm man water management, that it's just like a no brainer, I think for the government to step in, but we're constantly running. And I'm sure in your community, oh, yeah. this yeah. thing about big government response, what's the government's responsibility versus what's not the government's responsibility. Yeah, that whole thing, you know, um, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, we're talking kind of about the negatives. We have a, a, a really great community here and a lot of people are energized and we actually have a chance in this election if we just flip one seat in city commission to kind of change the perspective and have like what I would call rational land management, like really it's a, 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 something that's good for the whole community. Um, but yeah, it's true. It's like, uh, even, and even on another scale, like in Tallahassee, uh, if the Audubon society wants to plant native plants in a park, they then have to be responsible for taking care of them for the end of time through volunteers. It doesn't get like put into, and that's a small example. Um, you know, uh, but in, in places like Bond and Southside, they need the canopy cover. And, and the, the, the thing that the city won't talk about is that we are in the middle of a climate crisis. And we talk about solar all the time, but we don't talk about what's it going to be like when it's 10 degrees hotter during the summers here and people don't have shade when they're walking around. That, that's literally going to be a huge issue. If you walk under live oaks here in town, it can be 25 degrees cooler. They're so amazing, you know, and, and parts of town don't have any trees at all, you know, and it, it's, it literally is a resiliency thing, like, you, like you're saying. I mean, I'm not saying anything you don't, you don't already know. Well, you know, you start talking about the increase in temperature. One of the things that I think is interesting is that even though it's easier to do the math for the metric system, right? All the climate science is in the metric system, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about 1.5 to 2 degrees mm -hmm. C. You're talking 10 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Mm -hmm. So when you already have a heat wave that's uh, 100 and 105 degrees, and all of a sudden that's 110 degrees, who mm -hmm. lives, who dies? Who has the energy and the cost to cool their house? What about the elders? And then I think about the outdoor workers. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was, I was re you know, as I was preparing for this and like reading some of your passages, I'm just thinking about a, a nocturnal society, right? Mm -hmm. Do we become a nocturnal society for the outdoor mm -hmm. labor that is so crucial for making our society run for the mm -hmm. people? I mean, most recently saw us in India, right? Mm -hmm. Where they had a massive heat wave where people literally couldn't be working after 10 o'clock. But, you know, you touched on something you know, about the media and I'm a talk show host on two radio networks, KGNU and Denver Open Media here. And I think that's such a vital and crucial part of it, right? The corporatization of media and access to information and the crafting of messaging has clearly been detrimental. Can you tell us like how you got to the point where you're like, you know what, we're going to generate our own media because I feel like it doesn't, it, you know, yeah. there has to be like a point where you said this is it. 
Well, I mean, you know, just to give an example, the Tallahassee Democrat does a great and detailed uh, um, job on health and education. They do a great job, but basically they just publish developer press releases. And I think my breaking point, there were several others, and, and this may have come a little later, but it, it kind of exemplifies it, is when they did a puff piece on a developer who clear cuts all the time. And they quoted him as saying that he cries when the trees are cut down and he can't bear to be in town when they're cut down. So he flies somewhere else. And I mean, I know it was a puff piece, but the fact they didn't even, that they put it that quote in there or that they didn't fact check it. I know it's kind of ridiculous, but it's like, I'm pretty sure if you checked his travel records, he doesn't leave town every time a tree is cut down. Um, and that just kind of revolted me because I had just driven past these areas where you're saying, oh yeah, we do a great job, you know, basically saying he doesn't clear cut. And then the, this entire old growth forest is gone, right? Um, so, so I think things like that uh, and just seeing, seeing some of the way that, that uh, reporters were fed stories uh, by different political entities and getting a sense that, that the media that we were seeing was not unbiased. It was, it was, it was people pitching stories. <laughs> politicians pitching stories to the paper and maybe I was na naive before but when you look at something like the Orlando Sentinel you see a much sharper take on development the environment and things like that so so there are things the Democrat does well but but the development thing was not and so I that kind of was one of the things uh, that did it for me and then also the fact that they they did this thing where they they erased this community and put in a stormwater pond and a road <laughs> and uh, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing I just could not I couldn't believe that that people were ignoring ignoring this. And I don't mean people, I mean the politicians who made the decisions because there was a huge outpouring, but nothing happened. They just went and did it anyway. And I think that was the most eye-opening thing for me. And again, I was probably very naive about it, um, but you know, you, you always have to have a moment where, where you learn something and then you, you take and build on it. And that was, that was one of them for me. Yeah, it's certainly hard when you see a community turn out and you lose anyways. I mm. think, you know, that can sometimes be the most discouraging part for people. Yeah. And I think keeping people engaged when you lose something mm -hmm. to strive for more, I think, is a is a critical part. Well, what have you done when you're in that situation? I mean, have you had that kind of experience? Oh, certainly. I mean, yeah. thousands of people turned out. They bought billboards in rural Colorado in opposition mm. to this highway. But when we settled, we got this cumulative health assessment, which is finally being worked through, mm -hmm. but I moved on. It opened my eyes to other issues like you're talking about, right? Onto refineries, onto these other things that have built my career. And, you know, it's culminated last year in the state's environmental justice act, which by the way, wasn't going to be passed. Uh, governor threatened to veto it and talk about using media, used a Republican newspaper in Colorado Springs to inform the community that he would oppose the environmental justice act. But what did we do? We rallied people. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to his neighborhood. We put 8,000 flyers into Boulder, Colorado. And we said, we'll be back in two weeks unless you change your mind. I hope we can have these conversations. <laughs> and we went on the road to 11 cities around the state and we came back and we marched on his house with his own councilman, his own state representative, mm -hmm. his own county commissioner. And on the last day we passed the Environmental Justice Act. And I was, a, I'm honored to have been appointed by the Speaker of the House to this task force. Mm -hmm. And I, and I won co-chair out of all the people across the state of Colorado and my leadership. And we have a real opportunity now, I think, to bake in equity mm -hmm. into decision making. That's brilliant. Right? Yeah. And I think that that's important for over 10 agencies mm -hmm. across the state mm -hmm. and for listeners, CDPHE forward slash environmental justice is also translated into Spanish, justicia ambiental. Mm -hmm. And it is a, we are going to be needing your help to join in. And I think that that's the part, Jeff, that like, I think is really important is the government or schools. They teach you about four branches of government or three branches of government, but I believe there are four. Mm -hmm. That's you and me. That's the people power. And whether you're running a, a ballot initiative that the people mm -hmm. bring forward themselves, or there's so many of these positions, like when I hear you talking about zoning, right? There's boards mm -hmm. of people who you can't elect that wields a fair amount of power. And I think that they're, as I've read through, you know, um, the early turn of the century with the, the big oligarchs that were existing at that time the barons mm -hmm. part of the way they wielded power were through these appointees and i think mm -hmm. there was a concerted effort during the gilded age to reverse that right mm -hmm. elected senators yeah. more involvement and oversight mm -hmm. yeah and um 
I mean, we had the situation here where we gave wound up giving $27 million of money that was meant for the community in other ways to fund FSU stadium repairs. And no one in city staff could tell the commissioners where the idea had come from. How does that happen? <laughs> so you're talking about, I mean, like, and, 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 and some of the commissioners didn't seem to care that no one could say, where did this idea originate? It was just presented as if it had just kind of, you know, <laughs> been a miracle. <laughs> and so that's kind of, you know, what we're dealing with here is that that stuff happens and, and gets passed without like, what? <laughs> it's very strange. Um, yeah, and they prefer to do it when no one's paying attention, which comes back. Yeah, to them. yeah and also really the importance of libraries. Um, mm -hmm. Libraries are a gathering space like rec centers where the government does engage and they do yeah. post and they play a critical and vital role in the community engagement process for all government processes mm -hmm. that I don't think is really honored enough. Like I said, when I started this, but I want to switch before we get to questions from the mm -hmm. crowd and I'm kind of just interested there's some people who here have kind of advice if you're an aspiring mm -hmm. writer. So you've written guides on world word building and how to integrate the internet and social media into your strategy as a writer. What kind of advice for aspiring writers do you have um, mm. for the work they're doing? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, the thing to realize about publishing is it's extremely volatile right now. When, when my editor says to me, um, Jeff, I need edits on this, this novel now for a book that's published in March of next year. Like we need to send it to the printer now because of paper shortages and stuff. There's literally supply chain issues and paper shortages in addition to the usual volatility. So I guess what that means to me is what it's always meant because publishing has always been kind of volatile is you have to do the thing that's personal to you, the thing that interests you the most. You have to do the thing that's not, uh, you know, don't tr not ch chasing trends, do, do the thing that you want to do that gives you personal satisfaction and, and kind of make the market come to you. Now, one thing I would say in the social media age is it's really important to think about your personal book life versus your public book life and having a divide between them uh, and, and understanding that there's a difference between your outward facing self and the self that creates the books and, and not let those things overlap. So like, you know, sometimes it can be actually a physical thing. Like when I work on a novel, I don't, I actually have the internet blocked from my computer for months. Uh, and I might have my wife give me my phone long enough to check email <laughs> later in the evening. Um, but I have some kind of divide, uh, whatever that that might look like for an individual writer. And I think that that's really important because, you know, even just scrolling on social media can lose you a day of writing based on something that you find out that's disturbing or even not disturbing uh, and, and get in the way of the kind of deep deep uh, uh, expression of creativity that you need to put on the page. So those are really basic things, but those are two things that a lot of beginning writers seem to struggle with in workshops and whatnot. Um, you, and you can't be in competition with anyone else. It's, it's not that kind of a thing. It's not a race. It's like, it's just literally trying to improve your writing and, and do the most personal thing for yourself and create something that you're really proud of. So let's say you're an aspiring first time writer. I, there's a couple books I started writing. I have one that I've titled Jury Duty on Tax Day because I literally got jury duty on tax day while I was running for city council. <laughs> and uh, if you can imagine, just to put yourself there, I'm, at, I'm in jury duty. Yeah. Everyone's doing their taxes at the last minute, like every good American. Yeah. And uh, it felt very high school like. You're like, what's in box A? You're like cheating. Mm on a test a little bit and then these poor suckers were just stuck in a room with me <laughs> as i walked around being like my name's ian i'm running for city council <laughs> and i think it's a the, the book is meant to be a short book right mm -hmm. about the lessons i learned about running for office the first time that maybe someone could pick up this 70 page book mm -hmm. and say you know at the end i'm for it or at the end this isn't for me how does one go about finding a publisher in the beginning if you have a great idea that you've been working on well i mean uh, I've I've gone all kinds of routes. I've done self publishing. I've been with small presses. I've been with large multinational corporations uh, that are publishers. And I think one one misconception that I get a lot, just because there is this now ability to self publish, is that traditional publishing is dying or dead. Uh, that you don't need an agent and all of that. So one thing that I always ask myself with whatever book project is, you know how strange is this? <laughs> what is the potential audience? This is after I've written it. Uh, 
Um, and if the answer is, I think this has an audience, then, you know, if I was a beginning writer with that book, I would be trying to get an agent first. And I would be looking at other books that are somewhat similar and asking those writers if they are willing to, or, or finding out who their agents are, if there's somebody you admire. And then if some, some of those writers might be willing to, to answer a question about, well, do you like your agent? Would you recommend your agent? Uh, just so that you also can, can um, evaluate whether you want to even approach that person. Um, and, and then try to go the traditional publisher route uh, through an agent. Uh, but then for books that are a little more offbeat or, or there's a particular audience for it right off the bat, uh, you know, uh, you might self-publish uh, and, and then find a traditional publisher. There's just a lot of different ways that you can, can do it. But I would say traditional publishing is not dead uh, and finding an agent is often the best the best way to do things. The agent will will take a lot of pressure off if there's tense negotiations or anything like that. They'll get you more money. They'll understand the legalese of the contract. Uh, and they'll hopefully have a strategy for your career um, that will be useful. Um, and then that's what I found with the the two agents that I've had. So. Well, I think we're going to make a transition here to taking some questions from the audience. You know, if you're in the audience, there is a question uh, and answer box located at the bottom of your screen that you can use to enter these questions for us to read. But you know what I heard in summary, Jeff, is that, you know, the work, whether it's writing a book or doing the political work, it just takes the time for you to scheduling it. And it takes you time to put your mental fortitude to it. And I would 100% agree that the natural world is the most healing and, and, and needed space that we all need access to. And I just want to say thank you for your involvement. And I think you are a great example of somebody who is highly uh, accomplished and is still finding time to give back. And I think that that in my life has been such a critically important part that like success is, is measured in a lot of ways from the ways in which you engage with others and, and it gives back in the end, right? Like it's not, it's not like you do that and, and it doesn't feed back on itself and it's almost a karma. And that actually leads me into a question we have here from Emily in the audience. And she is asking if you would call your stories environmental karma. Um, I think what they do is they, they often interrogate what good or bad imagination applied to this question and re related questions leads to. Like we've been talking a lot about kind of bad imagination applied to even just basic things like land management. Um, I, I don't know that it's karma, um, but I would say that, that I do think that in my books, good imaginations and, and people really striving to do the right thing get some kind of reward. I wouldn't say that they're always happy endings, but there's some satisfaction there or some moment of, of triumph even in the middle of of <laughs> ruination possibly and those are the characters that i respond to i respond to characters who are trying to still do the right thing under difficult circumstances may not actually make it maybe flawed um, but at least they're trying you know and i think that that's really important uh, the imagery that that caught in my head of resiliency is like the plant that grows in the crack mm. not everything is perfect for them but they find mm -hmm. a way to to thrive in the situations that are presented to them uh i see a question here from the audience about slam poetry now that you want to see it in person i'm actually going to be performing with headroom sessions so if you go out and check them on uh facebook here in may in just a couple weeks i'm going to be performing with them with some live bands in person so definitely want to check that out i, I see a question here about obviously you know you write in this this uh sci-fi genre but do you also read that genre? And if so, do you have recommendations or books or writers that you would recommend? Uh, well, it's a really interesting question because I actually started out as a poet and I started out editing literary magazines. So I didn't really, I didn't for the longest time. Um, I wasn't really in the genre community. I'm kind of like still like one foot in poetry in terms of like where I read, what I read, mainstream literary fiction thrillers like everything like I read everything under the sun basically and that's that's the way I always kind of thought it was supposed to be um, in terms of climate crisis books I guess um, you could refer to a list um, that I did for Goodreads uh, last year um, it should be pretty easy to find with uh, 10 uh, recent books that I thought were, were really quite 
quite interesting. Um, none of the titles of which I can remember right now. Um, but I also remember reading a lot of the stuff about climate crisis back in the day, like even J.G. Ballard's short stories. And um, there's there's a bunch of writers in the 60s and 70s that were writing about stuff that was very close to, to what you might call climate crisis. Ursula K. Le Guin was doing it in the late 70s. So, um, so there's a lot of stuff out there, despite the fact that people sometimes have this refrain of, oh, not enough people are writing about it. But, but sometimes it's just that it might not be the thing that was popular at the time. Well, here's a good question. In Born and the Strange Bird, you emphasize the consciousness of bits of barely identifiable biotech. <laughs> How much do you attribute our callous approach to nature to the inability to emphasize with the state of mind of animals? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a really interesting ethical question, isn't it? Because I, I, I once heard a person involved in biotech say very happily that maybe kindergartners would be able to make little bits of life in 20 years in their classes. And I was like, we seem to have skipped this whole ethical question of, uh, is it actually ethical or right to manipulate life like this? And, and the more we learn about animal intelligence and the fact that there's a lot of a lot of stuff, uh, you know, a lot of sophistication there that may not look like human intelligence, but is very sophisticated and complex. Uh, the more that this, this, this kind of question kind of dogs me. And so those books are really about that question. You know, what happens when we create this stuff? Because we are going to, um, and how, how we use it. Um, what does it say about us if we skip that ethical component? Uh, what does it say about human beings if we if we get to a point where we're just exploiting because it also it feels to me that we're exploiting each other too and we're exploiting the landscape at the same time so some of these questions are slightly related i would also say just on a on a happier note that i'm really pleased with the progress that amc is making on the born series and i i hope there's an, a, a a further more substantive announcement about it soon but uh, thank you for reading those books I like this one from Jonathan here. You have so many strong female characters in your books. What in your life inspired these strong women characters? Well, I mean, there's there's a couple of answers to that. One is that my wife Anne is an incredibly strong woman. She was she was a computer programmer and 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 software manager in the deep south in the 80s uh and and one of the only one of the first women programmers like in the georgia florida alabama area and and going to to uh and, and living in this kind of man's world which is kind of what where with the character of jane that aspect of her character kind of kind of comes from even though it's in a different different aspect and 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 she's she reads all my books in process and i i talk things out with her in process in process so that's why all the books have, are also dedicated to her because she has a large role in uh, how i think about about that aspect the other one is you know a lot of my mentors were women like i would say almost all of my mentors like uh, and one of them was a librarian meredith ann pierce at a, at a library in um in gainesville florida i would bike over to the library as a teenager hand her my manuscripts get some books leave come back a week later and she gave me this this you know this marked up manuscript which really helped me um and so I've, I've always i think been surrounded by role models that are strong women and um that's definitely one reason i would say in annihilation that thinking about annihilation as a genre and thinking about all the movies of expeditions into weird places and there's like one woman in a scanty outfit <laughs> <laughs> and usually a scientist, but not dressed like the other scientists really kind of ticked me off over time. So in some ways it was a conscious reaction in part, you know, that this was going to be all women in this expedition and they were not going to adhere to any of those uh, stupid stereotypes. So. Oh man, that like totally resonates with me. Like obviously being a teacher, you work with a lot of women and even in public service, right? People who dedicate their time to that but I even spent time in high schools teaching some theater uh, with the Black Actors Guild here locally and really like any book written before 1970 especially plays mm. you know the men are just terrible to the women and their peers for three acts and then in the last scene everything's better and you win the day and what I would tell people is like this isn't reality I just want yeah. you to know that like every book written before 1970 like you're not going to get very far if you're not kind to people like the story doesn't spin your direction in the last scene it just doesn't so i like this one what's up with all the bears in your books jeff this <laughs> one travis well uh, that's an interesting uh point because we actually 
I mean, just as a, as a way of example of how many bears there are, I have a story called The Third Bear, where there's a horrifying bear that's not related to the bear and the flying bear in Born. But we spent about six months with AMC defining in one paragraph what bear was covered by the TV series around Born. And, and it had, had to be a flying bear that was uh, ferocious and of a certain size. And uh, at one point, I think one of the contract people were like, uh, put in something jokingly about also not Paddington. Um, and so my agent after that negotiation for the TV series was like, Jeff, can you not write about bears again uh, in terms of like media properties? It's actually kind of messing us up because I write about them so much, uh, but they're not they're not related universes. Um, so I, I just love the physicality of bears. Um, the fact that I learned that they're often they walk around and they're always kind of wounded or something's messed up. Uh, one bear expert put it as like being a linebacker. Bears are all like linebackers. There's there there's always a, a messed up ankle or shoulder or whatever else. But that's just the way they live. You know, that's the way a bear lives. And I thought that was fascinating. And then our our cat Neo, who's a 16 pound tuxedo Maine coon cat, uh, has these incredibly broad shoulders. And when he leans over the side of his platform from a certain angle, if you come around the corner you're like shocked because you think you're seeing like a small bear <laughs> or something on this platform the way he's lying so some of the physicality of the bear and born came from came from our cat <laughs> actually <laughs> well that's kind of interesting you know i went to columbia in december and i got to meet with a bunch of indigenous tribes there which was you know really profound for my emotional well-being but it's fascinating because you know, the jaguar, the big cat is like definitely like something that's revered there in the Central and South America, but also the bear. Mm -hmm. And there are these stories they tell about how, you know, a jaguar, the way they win is they break the neck of their animal, right? And they, mm -hmm. they can't do that with the bear. The bear, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so the bear is like the top, the top animal there that a lot of people don't really associate with the culture, but it, it totally is. That's fascinating, so, actually. Yeah. So. Yeah. Here's one from the audience about what was the fastest you wrote a book and how <laughs> long has it taken you to write a book? Um, well, it once took me 10 years uh, when I had a, a day job that was like Lord of the Flies with middle management uh, as kind of a consultant for this software company with the state. Um, I would only have time to write at lunch and I'd be too exhausted at night. So I'd write before I went to the to the job. And so that novel took 10 years and that was really you know, you, you, you become very patient. You realize I'm going to write half a scene. I'm going to write half a scene tomorrow. Eventually it's going to add up and eventually it did. It was kind of frustrating, but it, I, it also taught me a lot about patience. The shortest I've written a book is basically um, two. One is Annihilation, <laughs> which came to me in a dream. I woke up, wrote down the dream, got up in the morning. I had the characters in my head. And then like um, two and a half to three months later, I had a novel. Um, and then the latest novel I'm working on, this Ravine novel called The Stone Shed, has come together incredibly fast. And I think, I think the reason for both of those is that those two novels in particular, even though most of the detail in all my novels is from firsthand experience of some sort, even if it's transposed or translated into another context, uh, those are the settings I know the best. So I joke that I'm getting lazy because I'm just writing a novel set in the ravine behind my house. Uh, but it also means that it, the fastness is simply that there's no, there's no research. There's no, I know every detail of the place that I'm setting it in. Uh, and, and that can help a lot, especially since I happen to also have the plot in my head. Uh, but those are the two books, but they're also short novels. Annihilation was, I think, under 60,000. And this one probably will, 60,000 words. And this one will be as two, two. So that, that makes a difference. Well, how cool is that? It came to you in a dream and then it turned into a movie, <laughs> right? That's... Yeah, it seemed like a dream of the book somehow. It was not quite as faithful as it was supposed to be, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I can't complain about that, I guess. So what was it like to jump uh, from the books to the big screen? Like, how to, <laughs> like, tell us about that. And like, is it, is it everything you think it would be? Like, do you get to go on set and like, or is it like, we'll show you when it's done? Well, I mean, in terms of involvement, it was basically we'll show it when it's done, but they did did allow me to visit the set. Now, I was deathly ill from something that actually could have killed me when I visited the set, um, but there was not not any difference between visiting the set and not. So so I, <laughs> I visited the set and I saw the 
the actors and everything but in between i was just like so ill so i'd like kind of like it was a very surreal experience for that reason. It was like, I was seeing like sets that looked somewhat like my novel, but not, I was like delirious. Um, and uh, the weirdest thing I think was seeing the entire cast, uh, all five women, including Natalie Portman and uh, Gina Rodriguez in the distance. And in my mind, they're all like seven feet tall and they kept coming towards me and not getting any taller. And the weird thing is that they were all the same height. <laughs> So and I'm delirious, like out of my mind, feverish, and, and this amazing moment is happening. And uh, and I guess the biggest thing, again, was I, I thought they were like giants who strode the earth. Um, but just like Tom Cruise, you know, they make they make weapons for them that are the size that you can carry all day. Um, and that's one thing I learned from the set is that it's not necessarily that they can't carry them, but they can't do five billion takes with them at the normal size, you know. Um, I think the other weird thing is that they set up a um, they set up a scene on a beach without telling the bed and breakfast above the beach. So there was this weird thing on social media where this bed and breakfast suddenly saw all these weird skeletons on a beach and they were like calling the police and they were all over social media about I don't know what's going on. So there are things like that. And then we saw a rough cut of the movie and uh, the, the, the bear creature was not voiced. So it was just like some guy going help me. <laughs> So they, I guess they dubbed that in later. So there were some weird experiences with seeing it on the set and then seeing the, the rough cut. Um, so it was just basically overall, it was a, a learning experience. Uh, and, uh, and, and I've applied a lot of what I learned to, to Bourne, but, uh, but it was, it was mostly just very surreal. I even have a presentation I do about annihilation and the behind the scenes stuff. Cause some of it was, was pretty nuts. Mm. Well, here's a question from uh, Jojo in the audience. What writing program do you use and why? I use, um, let me see if I can find one. Um, I, I use, uh, here, this is what I use. I use this writing program. <laughs> I write longhand, uh, sometimes on little fragments of paper, sometimes if I run out of those and I'm hiking and I get an idea on, on leaves that are sturdy enough uh, to write on. And uh, then what I do is I type it up. I, what, what I basically do is I use them like, like little card, ca I actually have card catalog cards that I write on too sometimes, but I use them as little cards. I put them in the story order and then I type them up into a document. So I have like scene fragments and details from the entire novel, basically, whenever inspiration strikes me. And then I take that document at a certain point and use it as kind of like uh, a rough guide to some of the scenes, what some of the character reactions might be uh, when I write my rough draft, which I also do in longhand. Then I type it, that up. Um, and then if I'm not satisfied with it, I'll mark it up and I'll write it in longhand again and type it up again. But I don't use a program. I uh, Any program is a tool that's fine if it works for some people, but for me, every tool is built by somebody who has some kind of like vision that constrains the tool, right? And uh, and so writing longhand means to me that I'm not being constrained by something invisible. I can't I can't really uh, see because I don't know. I'm being shunted into certain kind of like rooms or or positions in 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 the uh, the writing uh, software. Um, so and I also like to incorporate mistakes and stuff and and not be efficient because that's not really what writing a novel is about it's about gaining the time to to think about the scenes and and uh and it's not like a business efficiency so for me it, this this is what works it drives my dad the scientist completely around the bend because he he doesn't he doesn't understand why i am not being efficient about it do you do you then take your longhand writing and type it all in or do you hand it off to someone else or? no 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 because when i type it up a lot changes from the handwritten bit already. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get myself in a receptive mode where I'm kind of living in the scenes again to the point where some things may change uh, when I type it up. Uh, and then, like I said, I will just render it down into long uh, longhand and type it up again, like kneading dough until it feels like it's ready. Um, you know, I'm kind of the same way when it comes to giving speeches or like taking notes and checklists, just really, I feel better writing it out, like writing lines, to figure out what I'm doing. Mm. But when I'm doing long-term visioning or planning for campaigns, mm. I've actually, you know, Google oh, yeah. Lens, amazing tool. Mm. You can take a photo and you can lift all the characters 
Mm. And you can put them into a document that is uh, saved me like a massive amount of time in recent years that I'm grateful for. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. And when I'm like planning out a, a, a book tour or plan, planning something for the public side of things, I do the same. I do the same thing in terms of using, you know, a strategic kind of approach. So I uh, just want to remind everyone, we have a little bit more time here. If you have questions uh, and you're just joining us, please feel free to jump on in here and list them. You know, there's some questions in here that have to do with mentoring. Mm -hmm. Have you spent much time in your life mentoring other authors? I have. Sometimes we come in, my wife and I, and we teach at a university creative writing department for a couple of weeks, or we uh, do writing workshops. And we also founded and helped run uh, Shared Worlds for 11 years, a teen writing workshop in South Carolina. So yes, I have. That's great. Um, here's one about your activism work. What organizations do you suggest others follow or financially support if they're able to? Mm. That's a big one. I mean, there's a, a list of who we support monthly that I'd have to actually, I think I actually tweeted about this. Then there's um, uh, the individual politicians that we try to give money to. Um, I would have to, that's a, a question I would have to, I, I can probably answer on social media tomorrow to some extent. It's just easier that way. All right. Here's a good question from Natasha in the audience. As someone who feels attached to Area X, particularly Annihilation, I often wonder how much your books echo one another, not just in theme, but in universality. universality. Ooh, it's a good word. <laughs> Do you imagine your stories occurring in the same universe or are they in some sort of detached multiverse? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, because um, at least one of the series has kind of a multiverse thing to it, which you could then read to mean that all the others exist in some pocket <laughs> of the of that one. Uh, but no, I, I do think of them as separate. Sometimes I I, um, I think of them, I think of something as thematically related. Like for example, for the Area X series, there's a story I wrote that's online called This World is Full of Monsters. And although it's not a continuation of the Southern Reach, I feel like in a way it's almost like portraying what would have happened after acceptance, but in some alternate universe. So sometimes my mind will will like worry at a at a problem or a, a unresolved thing in a series, and it'll come out in some other way that's not related, but it does solve the it does answer the question. Um, but in general, no, they're they're all they're all separate universes so you know when you start writing your books do you kind of have the message in mind before you create the story or does the story lead to the message yeah it's a good question I, I think it's more that I trust my subconscious a lot so like Annihilation came out because I said I I told my subconscious like three years before I want about want to want to write about Florida and the environment and I literally think of this as like talking to my subconscious and telling it, this is what I want to do. And then eventually something will come out. Um, Hummingbird Salamander came out again because I, in part, because I was like, I want to write something more direct about the environment. How do I do that? Um, so it's not so, it, the way that that, what that means then is it comes out in a very organic sense. Now, I, it's not just the subconscious. It's like, I read a lot of environmental books. I, 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 I you know, attended a lot of uh, meetings and interdisciplinary conferences where maybe I was speaking, but I was also going to other events. Um, and, uh, and so kind of the sedimentary layer of, of stuff that I can then use in the novel comes into being and, and it just tends to be whatever the theme is. Now, once I've written a rough draft or part of a draft, I might ask myself, it, what is it that this novel is trying to do on a thematic level? And is there some scene or scenes that isn't, that aren't written that would support that better? Or is there something I need to cut? But it is a very organic process. And one thing that I really trust is that my subconscious is going to provide the thematic element. And I'm not going to have to really think about that. It's just going to come out through the situations that, that kind of like start the novel. So here's one. Your work has been classified as weird fiction. Are there any other authors that you feel are pushing the genre into new interesting direction? 
Because to this uh, questioner, it sometimes feels like there's a tendency just to recycle Lovecraft. Mm, yeah. Um, well, we did a whole anthology called The Weird, which has some, I think, great examples. I mean, Stephen Graham Jones has a great story in there, I think is exemplary. Um, Caitlin Kiernan is an amazing author of The Weird. Um, there's a ton of them. Uh, Sylvia uh, Garcia Moreno has done some great stuff in that in that area. Um, there, there's just so many. The problem is in answering that question is we do so many anthologies and there's like hundreds of authors in each one um, that it almost it almost makes more sense to say uh, read that anthology or actually you can go to a, a site that we did called uh, Weird Fiction Review, which spotlighted a lot of amazing writers who maybe are lesser known, but I think are doing the really great work and all that content is free. So, so here's a question about one of your books. Did Amber Grease come out of your concerns about the environment, the very frightening gray crabs who were pushed out underground when the settlers arrived, get the revenge and haunt my mm. nightmares still. <laughs> oh, and I'm wondering if they have some connection to the things that come out in novels like Annihilation. Well, I mean, I, I think they're um, the ways, the way in which Annihilation, the Annihilation series kind of layers some different aspects of society is also something that the Amber Grease series is doing, but the Ambergris series is really taking a hundred years of an imaginary city, the history of it, and using that to, to kind of, you know, as a backdrop to these characters being swept up in these historical events and these, these things they can't control. And one aspect is the gray caps you, you talked about um, and, and kind of examining what happens when a terrible atrocity is visited by, by one group on another but it's never acknowledged. It's never dealt with. There's no reparations. There's no whatever. And so that under 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 is the underpinnings of the whole history of the city and why it can never have a coherent history or get past it because they never acknowledge it um, and they never deal with it. And so I thought that would be something that's very relevant uh, to the world we live in while the setting allowed me to, again, reconcile all of these different areas I'd lived in, but not in a way that was culturally specific, um, which I, which, you know, would then bring in all those specifics in such a way that it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. It'd be, it'd be terrible. Um, but in terms of the weird biology in those books, you know, I, I thought that the life cycle of squids and of, of fung fungi uh, were both uh, rife for writing something fantastical or surreal because they're so different from our own that it's almost like an alien life form that landed on earth somehow <laughs> and coexist with us because they're so different. So I thought that was fat, kind of interesting to explore. I see this kind of as a follow-up question. Are there any characters that you wrote about that haunt you? Mm. Well, I mean, I wrote a novel called Dead Astronauts because in Born, you know, I had put uh, these literal dead astronauts that Rachel finds at this crossroads um, that she can't tell whether they're actually in hazmat suits or they're astronauts who came back to earth to this you know in this post-apocalyptic uh age and uh, they i thought they were a real potent symbol for like the failure of humanity to get past its its uh it, its destructive processes on earth um hello elon musk and um and uh but they haunted me uh because it was such a potent symbol and so um i think that that that's one answer um i think that uh more the giant bear haunts me a little bit because I, I feel like he's kind of a tragic character in that he can only perform as to his nature, but he's also been altered to have that nature. And so he really has no, no way of working against it. And then Born in that same novel was built to be something deadly, but then is raised as if he's a child. Um, and so he has a different kind of conflict. And I think that's, that's kind of tragic. Um, so I think this is a good question. Uh, has observing and experiencing the pandemic like we all have changed your perceptions about human potential <laughs> to rise to the challenges of crises or our fundamental ability towards resiliency? And do you see that having an influence on your novels going mm -hmm. forward? Um, well, it's one reason why Hummingbird Salamander has the pandemic in the background, uh, that it's there. It's like a pulse. It's a, a thing you can't get away from, even though the novel doesn't actually deal with it directly. I thought it was important to be in there. But 
in terms of my own personal, I mean, I, like a lot of people, you know, we've seen the worst and the best of people during this, during this crisis, I guess the main thing that, that has, I found um, disappointing to say the least is not being able to rally around the actual facts of a thing and to now be so have some people be living in such an altered reality that's so non-fact based that it feels like they're living in a separate country alongside us that there are two countries that that don't really see each other um over this issue it kind of like it became more more visible even though it was visible before in other ways um at the same time at the community level i've seen a lot of people band together in tallahassee um, one reason we were able to get through it in Tallahassee is there was a Facebook group of people who it's called mask wearing establishments, just just knowing where it was safe based on people's observations and people caring enough about other human beings to to tell them that because the state wasn't doing anything. Um, so it's it's in the new novel in the ravine novel, um, because I, I think it's an important kind of pivot point will we will we actually now learn something. Will we be able to do better with climate crisis having gone through this? Does it show that we're fated to never do as well as we can with climate crisis? Is that a totally different issue that this doesn't impact? It's hard to tell because you know the climate crisis is also invisible in the causality, unfortunately, to some people. You know, A storm occurs somewhere, it's stronger than any storm in a hundred years. But does that mean that people then respond and say, yes, climate crisis is real, we need to do something about it? Well, you know, I just came from the state capitol where we're in the last days of our session and we're hearing a, a governor and leadership in the government who is still fearful of taking on air toxics as though there wasn't a direct connection between pollution mm. and the impacts on people. It is disappointing. I feel like it should have been so much easier this year than it has been. And people seem to be falling back into their patterns of elections but what I tell leaders is that people are looking for people that protect them. Mm. And we're seeing that with the rise of concerns around safety for the police, but that's the sole public health. And you mm. need to find a way, I think, of messaging because the real champions are the ones that are keeping our community safe, our family safe. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have time for a few more questions here. People are wondering if there are any topics and or settings that you have not created a story in or around that you're interested in? Well, I am, you know, I, there's a couple of things that I am working on. Uh, one is set in two countries that are never named, but are referred to the, by the locals as the good twin and the bad twin. Um, although they're not necessarily what they're described as. And I thought it'd be interesting to have two countries with interconnected history that, see, that, that, that still had very different histories, but have a very common like culture um, where it's never named where you are exactly to explore a lot of political things in a, in a context where one has suffered a lot from militias that eventually were reined in and things like that. And I thought that would be useful to to um, kind of explore some things actually happening or could happen in, in the US and um, without while having the distance from it to be able to write about it effectively. The other one is this Ravine novel because one thing I really think about, and I, I keep going back to housing, but it, it's it's a lot of the uncanny stuff I'm working on now, like one, one uncanny novel is about the subprime mortgage crisis of 2009. <laughs> um, and I found a way to like explore that while also writing weird fiction. But the Ravine novel, I think about the house we live in and how fortunate we are to live in this house um, that was created by a FAMU architect grad who thought that this would be the model around all the ravines in Tallahassee, because we have a lot. And I'm sure she was thinking too, it'd be the model for apartments that you could have high density, you know, around all these ravines while keeping the strip of woodland in the middle and you would have both things, you have the best of both worlds, but that's not what happened. <laughs> um, and so I, I the, in the novel, you know, there's this failed attempt to do just that in the 70s. And instead it becomes half acre lots with ho houses that are more expensive than they should be. But that history haunts the foreground of the novel. So kind of like with the Ambergris books, but in a contemporary setting where there is an uncanny element, but it's set in the present day, this woman inherits this house and she inherits with it the whole history of, 
of social and cultural of what happened before and what failed and what the consequences were for the community in addition to the other things that are going on. So I'm really excited about that because the layering of that feels like it's something that's relevant um, and something I haven't done in this way before. Here's a question back to Area X that a uh, question from the community they've always wondered is the owl in Area X actually the husband in evolution of the biologist or does it even matter what the answer is? <laughs> It depends. I mean, the, the only answer is, did you cry at the end of that section? If you did, then I've done my job. But um, but yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think probably probably it is it is for her husband, not to give spoilers away to the people who haven't read the book. But um, but yeah, I mean, that was a crucial section of the book too. I mean, really the whole book to me rides on on the authenticity of that section, whether you believe there's actually an owl that was once a human or not. Hmm. Well, I think we have just a couple minutes here left. I was wondering if you had any questions for me, Jeff. Well, I mean, I am curious um, about storytelling in the areas that you work in. So, you know, what is the narrative like? I mean, you have people who are working in what you would call kind of a nonfiction setting, but you must hear a lot of fictions. <laughs> is there is there a, a ratio of fiction to nonfiction that would surprise people who are not as attuned to politics in terms of messaging and how things get done? Well, you know, I think the idea of disinformation or fiction um, has a lot to do with the people in particular that you interact with, right? Mm. There are some that are predisposed, I think, to being liars. I don't know how else to call mm. it. And when you find that out about them, uh, often the hard way, I think it helps you discern a little bit better, right? It's mm. that basic science of trial and error, of figuring mm. out who and who you cannot trust. But absolutely, without a doubt, in my work in particular, since it's centered in justice, economic justice, social environmental justice, is that the industry will fabricate, they mm -hmm. will embellish. I think that there is certainly a grandiose nature and I don't know how many times I've heard the sky will fall mm -hmm. uh, and yet it remains. And I think that what I have learned in particular is that business in particular is, it wants consistency, mm -hmm. right? And so it would prefer the status quo and it will mm -hmm. do what it can to maintain yes. the status quo but once making said transition, it's the new normal to them. Mm, and mm, the, ten, mm, the kinks tend to work out. And how do you, how do you make that pivot? For, I mean, how, how do you, what are the strategies you use when confronted with the disinformation? Is it just talking to people or is it? Yeah, I mean, I think the only way to counter disinformation is with information. It is with the facts. And I don't think it's important to be consistent, right? I mm -hmm. think, mm -hmm. you know, where you see a lot of the spin is it's, they'll shoot out 12 different things, see which one sticks, and mm -hmm. then that will become their messaging. Whereas I think that people are truly centered in real policy solutions that are based in data and facts. It doesn't really change much. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you is, we have to do our own messaging, of course, right? Um, that Environmental Justice Act that we were talking about, mm -hmm. it went through and jumped through hoops to pass on the last day in the last hours. And our messaging was we use the rules for us this time, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's that, that visceral component to it, right? Mm -hmm. The emotional component. I'm certainly a fan also of alliteration. We're on a take on mm -hmm. toxics tour right now. I think that there are literary tools that I've learned through theater, Mm. Um, that have helped me in conveying a message that sticks for mm. people, right? Because you could tell somebody one time, but what we learned, especially for elections, is that five to seven times it really needs to enter into your mm. subconsciousness in some way before you're really prepared to take action. Mm. And some of that counts up as more. So if I actually interacted with you, Jeff, like we are right now, that's mm. two or three. Whereas if you are just being hit with mm -hmm. subliminal writing that isn't meant to be subliminal, right? But you're just in taking it, you know, those are a different count. But you try to get to seven. I mean, I think that's really the magic number. Seven generations, also a magic number that comes from my culture. Mm -hmm. I actually 
I think seven is how many slots are in RAM. I'm sure there are people who would correct me if I'm wrong here, but you know, there's only so many blocks in your brain mm -hmm. that you can hold on to information. Can, I learned yeah. that in psychology as well. And you have to find a way to pull on that. And I do think that, you know, the whole logos, ethos, pathos is incredibly important. And you have to understand who you're negotiating or working with to be able to understand that. And then there's a whole psychology to the language itself. There's a lot of writers who write about this um, where there is word context that is built. So I'll give you an example. If you talk about Obamacare mm, but, and course, you're debating yeah. and you call it's really the Affordable Care Act, but I'm debating someone and I'm like, well, the thing about Obamacare is you've already lost because the context mm -hmm. has already been put into that word. Mm -hmm. I think that's true for a lot of the things that people try to spin to be better. Let's take the tragic displacement of human beings who are unhoused on the streets and the destruction of their property. We call it a sweep. Well, we're just mm. sweeping up the streets here a little bit. And it helps you be calmer about the, the really traumatic right. imagery that yours are viscerally seeing. Yeah. And it's meant to, to, to try to be a, some sort of sedative to those feelings that you would normally have. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you find this in fiction in the sense that if you write about traumatic things using the same language as other writers always have, even if it's not stereotype or cliche, it's sometimes just the reader's eyes, they're just going to, they may like the scene, but they're not going to get what you want out of it. Um, so sometimes you have to really radically change how you use language to, to make it fresh, sadly, even though you would think the fact itself would be enough to to make someone empathetic to something so mm. interesting well i see one more question here that I, I think i can chat about people are asking in a world we're born what can we do about uh forever chemicals well the first thing you could do right now if you live in colorado is get on the phone and call your legislators if you're concerned about forever chemicals we have an opportunity to ban them in a majority of products that they're produced in and it is the first step of taking it out of circulation. It's unfortunate. We had recent studies here that came out that they studied wild fish all across Colorado, found them in all the fish, which means they're bioaccumulating in your body too. And we're going to have to find a way through technology of pulling them out of the water. It's, I don't really feel like there's a natural way. I mean, even burning them isn't working because we, we, we created this tech that is supposed to be heat and pressure resistant. Well, guess what? Nature breaks things down through heat and friction. And so it is a scary thing. I think the first thing we can do is take it out of circulation. There's, let's close with this one. I think that this is a good one. What possibilities do you see for housing becoming more affordable and healthy for people in America? Well, I mean, Florida, we, I mean, all the Democratic governor uh, uh, folks running for governor are talking about this because we have an unprecedented crisis right now, even as we have this building boom, which is the most deranged thing you can think of that we're building so much housing that's not affordable and not in the right place. Um, so, you know, I don't think Florida, just talking about Florida, can actually function much longer if this isn't addressed. So unfortunately, <laughs> it's it's come to the point where where it's so bad that even the folks who are incompetent in the legislature or don't care are going to have to care uh, because I think it is going to affect their political bottom line. It's just a shame that it got to this point. And then I also, be quite honest, just for Florida, I can't even assume that money that they might then put aside or or effort or whatever that looks like policy wise will actually wind up <laughs> going towards the thing in question i mean there's been so many environmental bonds and funds that wind up going towards anti-environmental things even after voters have passed referendums and things so we're in a pretty dire state of of if florida was a country you'd be basically saying it's becoming a oligarchy with anti-democratic tendencies and totalitarianism. Um, so, so I'm not sure what that solution looks like. I, I just think that the crisis is so great that, that they're going to have to do something. And I just hope, I hope it could be modeled in such a way that it's actually a good something. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I think we're 
we're seeing just in the richest world in the nation, how many people do not have access to the basic building blocks for self-actualization? Mm. No, without healthy food, water, housing, it's very hard for people to self-actualize. And I think people need to wrap their head around that climate crisis is going to lead to more migration, mm -hmm. right? And so we are going to have to find solutions to create stability, to protect mm -hmm. public health for everyone. But I do feel confident that in the pandemic, my, my, even myself, I turned to mutual aid in a way that I had tried for policy for years. And I found that taking even incremental steps through mutual aid of helping ensure that everyone has a chance to access water is incredibly important. I founded a nonprofit called Headwaters Protectors that started as a mutual aid group that literally cleans up the trash the city won't, provides drinking water. And I will never forget in the pandemic, washing the hands of a man and he began crying. Mm. He said he hadn't washed his hands in four days. Mm. And why? Because amazing places like libraries were closed, mm. right? Because these places that have become the Star Wolf support of those who need it the most, librarians have stepped into that space. Mm. And uh, I think that's a good way for us to wrap this up. You know, uh, Jeff, how can people follow you if they would like to? Yeah, um, it's pretty simple. On Twitter, it's just Jeff Vandermeer. And on Facebook, it's like, Jeff Vandermeer and uh, <laughs> and I, I do post a lot about nature but I also do post a lot about politics and things like that and one thing I would like to say about the the library uh, Jefferson County Library is my daughter Erin Kennedy actually works for a company metabolic a sustainability company that has done work for the city of Boulder and she has visited the Jefferson County Library and she was incredibly impressed by the community outreach that she saw there and the various things that were happening. And, and she made a point of saying that to me. I, I said I was doing something that was connected to Boulder, but I didn't mention the library and she brought it up. So I thought that was, that was pretty, pretty amazing and kind of uh, ties into my experience uh, of, of this, the, the lead up to this event, which I was very impressed by. So, and it's, it's so great also to, to talk to you, Ian. I, I really appreciate your insight on these very important issues that, that also are you know, issues that I think need to be dealt with uh, in fiction. Uh, a lot more. Well, Jeff, it really has been a pleasure. I just put in the chat for everyone how you can follow me at Believe EAN on all socials or check out my website, iantafoya.com. In a world reborn, we have to work together. It is through collaboration, cooperatives, ownership, cooperative planting. This is the power to change the government and to change the way that you live. And so I hope that you take those native seeds that were provided to you mm. at the library. It's awesome. Yeah. You wild and produce that back into the community that you learn about the medicines around you. I personally, you right, know, I heard I'm a horticultural therapist. I have a YouTube video that teaches you about more than a dozen local plants here in Colorado that are edible and provide healthy properties to your body. When I hear so much from my community about food injustice and food scarcity and food deserts, I remind people that this world was built to keep us alive and to thrive and that there is so much abundance around us. We just need to tap into it. And I have a lot of faith that we can do it and we can do it together. That's why my motto is together we rise. I'm gonna welcome back the staff here at Jeffco Library to close us out. But thank you so much to all that tuned in today. Awesome. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you both. Thanks for the wonderful discussion. Um, personally, as a huge Southern Reach Trilogy fan, I appreciate the closure on the owl. Um, I'm going to go, <laughs> nice. someone go edit the wiki. We'll get that in there. Um, and, and we just want to say, Jeff, thank you for your amazing body of work. I really oh, admire your passion for the environment. Um, and Ian, thank you so much for facilitating tonight's discussion. Um, with your really thoughtful questions. Thanks for your local leadership and activism. Thanks for helping to keep Colorado green. Um, and once again, we just really appreciate y'all for being here this evening. <laughs>